I told Brett and I think somebody else that besides learning myself, I enjoy hearing the devotional talks on Wednesday evening because they give me ideas. And I told Brett when he delivered his that he gave me an idea that I wanted to pursue besides it just being a good message concerning living life. Now he referred us to the book of Job and that caused me to think about some things. And it has to do with the study of good and evil. And in this particular study, I want us to study what is called the problem of evil as it relates to the existence of God. And when we finish with this study, I trust that the auditors will understand why evil exists in the world how the problem so-called of evil fails, fails to disprove God, and why faith in God is essential to make an accurate judgment regarding such events as uh, murder of the unborn, abortion on demand, or the killing by the Nazis of six million Jews, and you can think of a host of other evil acts. So our aim is to note that the so-called problem of evil does not, it does not prove the non-existence of God. Now, reference was made to Job in Wednesday night's sermon by Brett, and I wanted to add this to that, and that is Job 1, 8 through 12, and I won't read all of it, but I will read some of it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear thee or fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Put, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath. He'll curse thee to thy face. Then he goes on. Now one of the things I want us to emphasize is that it was God himself who drew Satan's attention to this man that God calls a righteous man, one who loves the truth and righteous living and hates evil. This begins to tell me by implication the design and purpose of life in the flesh on this earth and why there's ever such a system as we live in now. It is a trying, testing, or proving time. And uh, all that works in this life is designed for that purpose. Will we love God, have faith in Him and His system of salvation, and strictly adhere to what He teaches or will we live by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, as if there is no God, and there is no afterlife, there is no judgment, there is no day of accounting, there is no heaven, there is no hell. Now, people are doing that. And in a secular materialistic world, the United States has become, and the Western world in particular, really the whole world, but especially in our, our age, uh, become those things, then we can expect more and more of this kind of thing. Now, it was pointed out by Brett concerning the text that Job underwent probably, at least I can't remember anyone else listed that way, more terrible tragedies than he did. And one day he lost his wealth, he lost his lands, he lost his family. His body was smitten with sores, more likely boils, and, we might say, to add insult to injury, she who ought to have been his suitable help, if she had done what God created her to do, his wife, told him to curse God and die. Sadly, this is many times the reaction of a lot of people when tragedy Terrible things befall us. Or our loved ones react this way. When we do not possess true biblical faith in God and His system of salvation. And that kind of thing grows more every day. 
those who purported to be his friends, that is Job's friends, worried him to a frazzle because they believed evil only comes to someone because that person's done wrong. They had no concept seemingly that a good person could suffer bad things. But when we look at this man Job, he retained his integrity and he did not curse God. What a marvelous study that is, and we need to spend a lot more time in our daily devotions reading about him because the Holy Spirit had James refer us back to him and understanding how we're to bear up under privation and persecution as we love the Lord and keep his commandments in this life. Ye have heard, James says, of the patience of Job, and their patience means bearing up under terrible strains and trouble by keeping on doing what is right. Now, I want us to notice the social and cultural environment in which we live. You say, why do we need to notice that? We're in it. Well, when you're in something day by day and you gradually grow into it, really what is happening sometimes doesn't impress us maybe like it ought to. But I want to drop back a ways in history. This is a long time ago. The Civil War took place. And unless you read and study about what it did to this nation, you won't really appreciate it because we're too far removed from it. And yet we're still feeling in this nation the repercussions of what transpired. Of course, other things happened with the winning of the West, and all such things happened there. We can't go into all of that. But then we had the great economic depression that was worldwide in the 1930s. And, of course, before that, there was World War I. And then following the Depression, or actually helped to end it, was World War II. And you couldn't think of greater catastrophes and tragedies than that. Then we look around daily and we see all kinds of church uh, child abuse and its growth. We see all kinds of sexual abuse and promiscuity. And, as I said earlier, abortion. We see all kinds of diseases. We see all of that kind of thing happening. We see growth of materialism and the no hope that it breeds in people. We see then the surge of the secular influence in America. We see what radical Islam has done in the 9-11 situation. And then on a personal level in your life and ours we have to deal with hardships and ups and downs and death and sickness and all that goes along with being a human being in a fleshly body in this life and for the Christian to live like the Lord teaches by his authority in the New Testament then as Paul said all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution that is persecuted because you love the Lord and keep his commandments, and you make decisions as to what you will and won't do by the truth of God's word. But questions are raised in the minds of people regarding uh, such tragedies. Uh, why do such terrible things happen? And the further they get removed from the knowledge of the Bible, the more these things come up because they lose their anchor. Who's responsible, if anyone, for all of these kind of things? But then even more complex questions than these arise, arise out of such terrible ordeals. If there is a God, how could he permit things like this to happen? How can we believe in God when such evil exists in the world? How can we believe that a merciful, just, good, and holy God exists? Now, this is, these things uh, are not new. And the question we're dealing with is a very old question. Thus, we need to revisit it, though, because every generation has to be retaught, and every generation has to experience the same thing, and we fail to realize sometimes a lot of things have been already dealt with and answered, but we don't know it, and if we don't know it, they might as well not have been addressed and answered. I don't know of anyone who denies the real 
objective existence of evil in the world. At least anybody that's considered sane and rational. Thus, we will say that it is self-evident that real objective evil exists all around us. As I've been describing it, and you, if you watched the news this morning, you, you saw it. So why does evil exist? Why does evil exist? Evil exists in the world because human beings have the power of choice. The Bible teaches that all men have the choice between what is right and what is wrong. One of the most famous scriptures regarding this free moral agency, this power we as humans have to choose, is found in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, where Joshua says to the children of Israel not long before they're going over to possess the land of Canaan, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And this points out that I have a choice and you have a choice. A normal human beings have free will. They can and they do choose. In fact, if you were to sit down, just think for a minute, we make choices all day long every day. And some of them are so natural to us and so a part of our lives, we don't realize that we do that. But we do all day long. In order for a person to have free will then, to make choices, he must be able to choose, that's our course of action or non-action as the case may be, between what is right and wrong. If there is no choice, if there's no choice at all between the two, then we are no different than the program for a computer. When a computer program malfunctions, who's responsible? The creator of the program. That's the reason these software companies come out with new software. They test and 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 they test. They send out betas and all this stuff trying to find, guess what? The bugs that are there. Because they're responsible for how that thing works, interacts with the hard drive on the computer. When a computer program malfunctions, then the creator of the program is responsible. That poor software can't make a choice. The Creator made the choice of what it does. If we were not free to make our own choices and in doing so make wrong choices, then God Himself would be responsible, just like the programmer, for the evil we do. But we are responsible for our choices. Now the atheist comes along with the question, Why could God not have created a world in which mankind could exist with no evil? The simple and correct answer to this question is because humans would not be human if they had no free will. You wouldn't be what you are and we are. I said this world is created for the purpose God created it. It never was meant to be a place where you're going to reside forever. They say, well, God put Adam and Eve in the garden and they were designed to be able to live forever. But he made them with free will and he said, don't eat of that tree in the midst of the garden for in the day that you eat thereof, I shall surely die. What happened? Have you ever noticed the end time you say, if if, if this were painted, if this were a solid wooden bench right here, and there was a sign on it that said wet paint, you know what most of you do? You'd touch it. (laughs) 
and then be surprised because you had wet paint on your finger. That's the way we operate, though we shouldn't because we have self-control and we should do that without proof. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus and then prove all things. Hold fast that which is good, First Thessalonians 5.21. So we have free will because God gave us that free will because he was putting us into a world where even though he made us be able to eat of the tree of life, when we broke his law, we forfeited that and he put us out of the garden and man died immediately spiritually. He was separated from God and then he began to die physically and the further he got away from the tree of life in the garden, the shorter his lifespan became. Until finally, of course, we live 70 or so years and, and we go. Choices entail consequences. If there's anything about Adam and Eve and what Eve was deceived to do by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of pride of life, and Adam just went into it with his eyes wide open and broke God's law, then we learn choices entail consequences. And this life is to try to show us you must choose rightly. That's what Joshua was saying. You have the power of choice. Now make up your mind which way you're going. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, there, was con there was consequ were consequences. Moses wrote, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity, which means hate, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the earliest prophecy of Christ being born of a woman to deliver man. Then he said unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And so on he goes. Why all of that? Because they were people with choice, and they made the wrong choice. They chose to disobey God. And thus the consequences are suffered. Now, somebody might say, well, but there can be theoretical situations. What if the battleship Texas was renewed and they brought it up here and it was right out front and it trained its guns on this building and you got five minutes to get out before it shoots? That's uh, absurd to say the least. That's no choice at all. What ifs do that? What ifs may help you think through something, but what ifs, what ifs are theoretical? Choice occurs in the realm of reality, where we are in this fleshly body in this natural world. It's the place of where we exercise our free will. It's the place where we make our choices. What actually could or could not happen in the here and now in time and space. In order for anyone to choose, not only must he have the ability, which we do, to choose, but he must have the real, actual opportunity to make that choice. If one has the opportunity to choose, then one can truly choose and expect consequences as a result of that choice. Or in the case of pleasing God, being blessed by him. The Old Testament lesson that comes down to us, that's applicable to us under the authority of Christ and the gospel system, is that if you take God at his word, he'll bless you. And if you reject God or break his word, you'll be punished. There are consequences for doing so. Again, our atheist friend asks why it is that God would or could not create mankind in such an uh, environment that he always chooses what is good. Well, the answer is this. In order to choose good, it must be the case that real opportunity is there for one to choose evil as well. We spend our lives making choices. And many of those choices are either good or bad. The consequence of a bad choice is sin. And that's the only 
and real evil. That's the only thing to keep you out of heaven is to die guilty of sin, not anything. Your mother-in-law may not like you at all because you have curly hair and all her grandchildren have straight hair. It won't keep you out of heaven. Attitude that's contrary to God's word may develop to where it doesn't happen. But the point is, only transgressing of God's law, lawlessness. We studied in class this morning about things being done decently and in order. You can't have that without God's law. You just can't do it. In 2 Samuel 11, chapter 11, notice the multiplicity, and I underscore multiplicity, of consequences that King David brought upon himself and others when he chose to commit adultery with Bathsheba, 2 Samuel 11. That was written four times for our learning. Paul says, Romans 15, 4. Do we learn? There are consequences to bad actions. That's one reason young people are told, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Form your life early on, loving God and keeping His commandments. Make choices that put you close to God, that keep you in a position to studying the Bible, not that which will pull you away from God and godly things and godly people. What if there were no consequences for making wrong choices? What if God miraculously stopped all consequences from happening when we chose to do a wrong thing? My grandfather, without going through the details, had a surgery which was ahead of its time in 1936. And in doing so, they removed all the ribs on the left side and they cut nerves and he had no feeling back here. And he had to take the place of those ribs. He had to wear a band around him to support him because he had no ribs there. Well, of course, they didn't have Velcro and things in those days. And so they used safety pins to hold it together. He had to be very careful. My grandmother had to check him out every day, make sure he didn't pin himself uh, to his, what we called his belly band. <laughs> See, all pain itself is not bad, is it? Pain tells you something wrong. And we all went hunting, and of course where I came from, you're going to get sometimes in the woods in the middle of ticks, and he always had to get my grandmother to look on his back, see if a tick had decided to latch on there. He couldn't feel it. So we need to have ways of knowing the consequences of our actions. The problem is, is that some choices that are wrong have a way of haunting us the rest of our lives. If you had what I said regarding stopping those consequences when we made bad choices, you realize how much then confusion would reign? That's the reason I give the example of my grandfather. Decisions involving choices made under such circumstances are not really choices when the outcome is going to be obvious. Our jurisprudence system recognizes that confession of a crime by one under duress is inadmissible in a court of law. This is the case because a person could have been tortured and coerced as to confess to something that he or she did not do. Furthermore, how could people be held responsible for their ultimate choice if the consequences did not occur? By the way, going back to the other part, do you remember Paul said that he forced brethren to blaspheme the name of Christ when he was Saul of Tarsus to persecute him? Again, justice demands that there's a difference between murder and even attempted murder. And the choice of one is not equal in punishment to the choice of the other. And if people who are secular can recognize that in the forming of laws in our jurisprudence system, I wonder where they got built within their being to even think that way if we're just matter in motion and we just are happenstance evolved higher form of animals ultimately from dead rocks and dirt. Where does that sense of oughtness come from? Consequences must be allowed to happen if there's going to be free choice and as a result of consequences evil exists. 
And I assure you that in the rearing children, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, they're going to have to understand and being trained and taught that there are consequences to their wrong actions. Or else you're going to get what we've got a whole lot of today in our world. The atheist asked, why could not mankind be allowed to choose evil, but the consequences of evil just be stopped? Again, we emphasize it's the case because in order for a choice to be a real, actual choice, it must be made in an environment that is free from mitigating situations and circumstances. In other words, it doesn't make any difference when it comes to your life as an accountable person to God and your choices. If you decide today you're not going to obey the gospel and become a Christian, is God going to say on the day of judgment, that's all right? You won't suffer the consequences. The Bible is full of material that says, oh no, there are consequences. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be saved too. Your Bible doesn't read that way. And if it is infallible and inerrant, all sufficient, final and complete revelation of God to man that will judge all of us on the last great judgment day, then God meant what he said, and he said what he meant. Does the so-called problem of evil prove that there's no God? Atheists will say that because of the existence of real evil in the world, then God does not exist. They say that for such to be the case involves a contradiction with the idea of God, what God is. And here's how they argue. First of all, if God is all good, then he opposes evil. Number two, if God is all-powerful, then he can stop evil. Number three, if God is all-knowing, then he knows when evil is going to happen. And number four, thus they conclude that a combination of these three things leads us to the conclusion that since God does not stop evil when he is able to do so, this means that he doesn't exist. That's the reasoning. Well, does this prove that God does not exist? Absolutely not. It works to do the very opposite. It actually proves the existence of God. If there is evil in the world, and there is evil in the world, then how can we judge it to be evil? How can we judge it to be evil? Only by the existence of objective good. That's exactly how we do it. Paul would say it like this. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 3 and verse 20. Real, objective evil implies the contrary. That is, not that God does not exist, but it implies that God does exist because God is good. In fact, Jean-Paul Sartre, who was an uh, existentialist uh, atheist philosopher who'd been dead a number of years, he was a Frenchman, said simply, if there's no God, then there's no evil. He said it this way, if there's no God, then anything goes. And he's right. Now, God doesn't arbitrarily set up laws. Laws flow from the very essence of what makes God, God. The atheist simply failed to prove his case to show that there is a logical incompatibility with the concept of God and the concept of evil. You wouldn't know how to measure what is evil if you didn't have the standard of good. You just wouldn't. And that good comes from God. Why is God necessary to judge abortion and the like to be evil things, rape and so on? Again, if there's no God, there's no evil. A murder, rape, and so on. One or many would simply be another human event, choice, devoid of moral value. 
That's the reason when Brother Warren in 76 debated the then atheist Anthony Flew, and he brought up the Nazis killing six million Jews in a horrific way, that Flew, who himself was in the intelligence of the British Army, wanted to be terribly upset at such horrendous treatment of those people. Brother Warren says you deny the existence of God. On what basis do you determine that it was moral evil that they committed? He never could answer it. And no atheist can, can answer that. The actions on the part of law enforcement officers, physicians, and people like that, would contain no moral value. There's no God. There's no standard of what's good. So, you know, if it's violated, that's evil. So how do you explain the difference in a physician saving a life and a terrorist killing somebody? They're just actions. No moral value to either one of them. Their human acts would be no different than that of then the terrorists of 9-11 or the abortionist or the liar or the thief or the covetous person or the kidnapper. Just another non-moral choice. And I don't know of any atheist that will say that the killing of 6 million Jews was just another non-moral choice. And the eight women killed in Atlanta. Was that just another non-moral choice? Or pick out any murder you want to. Or the abuse of little children. Is that just a non-moral choice? Well, if God doesn't exist, there is no standard of good because it flows from the essence of what God is. There is a God. The one true and living God says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He declares, Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. This is the same God that says concerning evil, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelation 21, 8. That's the God who is love because love demands that that which goes against love have consequences. And in this life, we have opportunity to prove to God we'll love Him, have faith in Him and His system, and obey Him. But at the end of this life, we're all called to an accounting. The same God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Romans 12, verse 19. The same God that praises the heroes condemns the villains. And one day, He will justly and completely and finally judge all mankind. Romans 11, verse 22, the inspired apostle wrote, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. But watch, is conditional. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Again, Romans 11, 22. Our conclusion is we ought to be thankful for the judgment of God found in the divine record on the pages of the Bible. By the scriptures we know what is right, what is wrong, what is good, and what is evil. Thus Paul wrote to Timothy that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. With the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. We can stand up, condemn sin, and point people to the gospel, which is God's power to save men from sin, Romans 1, 16. It is to be preached to every creature because good needs to invade the evil precincts of sin for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Christ died that the truth of the gospel might be signally developed and heralded throughout a lost world. Through proper knowledge of the Bible, we can know how to make our life right with God. Evil exists today because of evil choices that human beings make. Rather than prove that God does not exist, evil proves God does exist, that He loves us, 
that he has mercy upon us through Jesus Christ, that he wants all men to be saved, and he holds off the coming of Christ to give men the opportunity to make the right choice. God is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, and that's the coming back of Christ but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. This is the case because we would not know evil without the knowledge of what is good. And listen to this. Jesus said, none is good save one God. Luke 18, 19. Without the divine standard of right and wrong, we would be lost to judge murder. Rape, theft, abortion on demand, and all the other things that we consider immoral and amoral, and all the evil events of history to be real, objective evil. This world was created as a place for people then to choose to love and obey God and shape their moral character in the likeness of Christ as they walk according to the perfect law of liberty, James one twenty five. And this is the only time we have. And we fail the schoolroom of life if we don't use it to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto us, Matthew 6, It is perfect for what God made it to be, a place to get ready for heaven. And that's all he ever intended, our lives and flesh on this earth and the way he formed this world for it to be. And if you use it for anything other than that, you're a failure. God is not on man's finite timetable, for time does not govern God. He will usher in the new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness in his own time and at the end of time. Now listen to this. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack, as I said earlier, concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of peace in him, without spot, and blameless, and account that the long suffering of God is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Second Peter chapter one verses seven through fifteen. Now I want to say this, and I'll be through. I've said this before, but have you noticed in every one of these fellows that say God does not exist? I know it, and I can prove it. But every one of them are mad because they're not God. You notice they're always sitting in judgment of God. Well, I do it this way. I do it that way. I think this is wrong. But he's not God. He's another human just like we are, finite and limited. But he has free choice. And he can serve God and keep his commandments or he can reject him. And so is the same for you. If you need to obey the gospel of Christ by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, the Lord will add you to his church, and therein you can serve him faithfully. If as a child of God you have made some poor choices and the consequences of which is separation from God, you can repent of those sins, come confessing them, and pray God for forgiveness. And at this time we give you that opportunity to do so while we stand and sing.